Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to do a interview me, so I asked you for a bunch of questions. Um, this is going to be the first video of a few different videos on this, um, but let's dive on in. So the first question here is how many number of books you read after starting your financial engineering till today, and how you read them cover to cover, half, etc. Okay, so first off, for me to consider reading a book, I have to read it cover to cover, even if it's extremely painful. When I start a book, I usually have to finish it. I don't think there's ever been a book that I've started and have not finished. Um, number of books, that's going to be a tough one um, if you're talking just financial engineering related, just banking related, but I'll give you a little bit of a view here on my reading list. So I have them stacked up here. Okay, so these books I have 100% read cover to cover. I would consider these as read. So from this stack, I've read 22 books cover to cover. Um, you'll notice here too that I have like all the FRM books. Uh, I have things such as like business cycles and equilibriums, which is more of like economics. Uh, my life is a quant, which is again, more like the soft side of financial engineering. Um, again, a lot of different unique books here, like Crucial Conversations is developing soft skills. Um, Jack Welch is winning again is a book I received. Um, this book you can't see we reviewed earlier on high frequency trading by Hyam Bodek. Um, anyways, this is just like the 100% complete books, I would say. All right, so these books are books I would not say I have read 100%. Like I haven't read these cover to cover. So in my mind, they have not been read. That being said, though, most of these books I have read, like, for example, Statistical Analysis of Financial Data and S+. I've probably read 95% of this book. I jump around in the book a lot. I use this for grad school. We went cover to cover. I think we only skipped like one or two chapters, but even then we've covered almost all of it. So this is like almost 100% read, but I just don't feel comfortable saying like it's 100% read. And I say that for almost every textbook. So you'll see in both of these stacks here, um, I've basically read the books in both stacks. Uh, some books like this time series analysis book is brand new. I've read, I don't know, 80 to 100 pages out of the book. I still have not finished a lot of the book I want to go through, but other books like I mentioned, like this one, um, even like these financial engineering books by Stephen Shreve, they're all books I've read over and over again. And Waldridge's book over here, which I've referenced, I use this in my job all the time. So I'm always looking at the book. I'm always reading the book. Um, most of these books, if you open them up and look inside, there's highlighting and there's like comments written on the side. Um, but yeah, these books, like probably the vast majority of these are at least 75% read, but I just leave most of my textbooks as considered unread because I just read so much of them and I continue to read them. But a lot of times I don't necessarily read them cover to cover, um, but it is definitely one of my goals is to read these cover to cover. Something else I'm not showing you here are all the other books that I actually read. So I'm not a huge fictional book fan, but I have read some Harry Potter books, for example. Um, other things that I do read, which I don't have here, um, are like psychology books. So yes, I read a lot of psychology. Uh, I read a lot of scientific books. For those of you that don't know, I'm a beekeeper. Uh, I read all of the science and like the chemistry and biology behind like honeybees, for example. I read a lot about like physics, geology. Um, there's all kinds of things I'm reading. All of these things are important, I think, for being a quant in the sense that it helps you view things and think about things much differently than you would um, as someone who only reads finance or only reads, you know, finance and quantitative finance or just business. You need to well-round yourself. You need to read as much science and rigor and academics as you can. Um, something else to note here is I've published two papers, so kind of along the lines of this, and I do a lot of my work at work. Um, but a lot of that requires reading of academic papers, research papers, white papers. Um, so I've probably read at least, I don't know, I'd say close to 200, 250 academic papers of some sorts um, just for doing my job and personal interests and kind of hobbies as well. Okay, next question here is, why are you keeping your beard in this video? So yes, I've had quite a few people ask this actually at work and other areas of my life. YouTube, stuff like that. Yes, I have a beard. Um, it started out with just me being a little bit lazy, not shaving, and then in a hurry. So I just shaved like the bottom and then I shaved like other parts of it to keep it well groomed. And then I started getting a bunch of compliments um, out and about and at work and stuff. So I've kind of left it for the time being. This is probably one of the longest beards I've grown, but it's just a personal preference. 
I don't know if you guys like it or not. You can put in the comments below what you think. Uh, typically in finance though, uh, clean shaven is the way to go. It takes you more seriously and everything. Um, but at this point, I'm just kind of letting it grow out a little bit. I'm sure I'll shave it soon. Um, but yeah, that's why I have my beard right now. All right, so next question here is, have you ever considered moving to buy side? Um, so let me kind of lay some foundation here a little bit. A lot of people view finance as buy side, sell side. I guess technically speaking, I'm on the sell side because I work in credit risk right now. So we sell loans. Um, buy side, sell side though, I work in the risk management side. So we're kind of behind the scenes on the sell side. But yes, I've considered working on the buy side. I've actually considered moving into the hedge fund realm. Um, unlike most people in credit risk, I have a deep background in time series um, and market risk. So I have the aspects, I have the skills. I think I'd be a great fit for moving into like a hedge fund realm. Um, that could be buy side. Uh, have I considered it? Yes. Will I move there anytime soon? No, probably not. Um, that's a whole nother video in itself, but a lot of it has to do with like work-life balance, um, career goals, and kind of where I'm headed now. All right, so next question is, are you working more on model development or model validation? Um, so just to answer this question first, uh, I currently work in model validation. I have worked in model development, model implementation, and internal audit of quantitative models in the past. So I've covered all the areas, but right now I'm doing just model validation. Um, does your company do most of the validation work in-house or do they send it out? All of our validation work is done in-house. Um, a lot of companies back in like 2010 through 2000 and maybe 14 or 15 was a lot of vendors. Uh, a lot of the banks have moved away from vendors or consultants because they're super expensive. And to be quite honest, uh, the quality you get isn't really the best, especially if you can hire really good talent in-house um, and do it for a lot less money. And then finally, are you still working with stress testing? Yes, I am still working with stress testing. I am still doing CCAR, which now we are considered HCR, Horizontal Capital Review. Um, but I actually like it. I like stress testing. I think it adds a lot of value. I'm still doing it, but a lot of my work now is moving into like CSOL models and IFRS 9 and Basel and all kinds of other regulations. But actually the vast majority of my work is focusing around um, money-making models. So how do you price models? Uh, how do you originate different loans, products, um, servicing models? So how do you go about selecting who you basically collect from? How do you collect from them? How do you optimize collections? Uh, yeah, so I've done a lot of stuff. Right now, stress testing makes up a small part, but I am still working in that realm. All right, your top five skills. Top five skills. I feel like this is its own video. I would say the first top five skills um, is communication. So... I'm gonna make a whole video on communication. There are three types of communication, which I will cover, but being able to communicate both with business people, um, average Joes and technical people is very challenging and very difficult. And while one group might think you're a stellar communicator and you're the best ever, the other group thinks you don't communicate well. I think I've done a really good job in my skill set of trying to blend um, technical and non-technical and business all together into one. So one is communications, two is ability to learn. I can teach myself, I think, almost anything. Um, I have this very strong confidence, which is part of this kind of skill set. Um, I think I can do anything. So heart surgery, I'm sure I could do it with a little bit of practice, not a big deal. Um, I've taught myself machine learning, neural networks, um, time series, analytics, stochastic calculus. Like a lot of this I've covered in grad school somewhat but then being able to take that to the next level and really learning it deeply. Uh, so teaching yourself to learn, I think is crucial. It's one of my top skills. The third one is programming in itself. So being able to program, I actually really like programming, which we'll cover in another question below. Uh, but yeah, programming is probably my third skill. Fourth skill is time series. I am absolutely obsessed with time series. I think it is my favorite topic um, in quantitative finance and probably most topics in general. If you can get me going on time series and talking intellectually, um, I can talk on it for, I don't know, hours, hours and hours and hours. And there's still more and more to talk about and more and more to research. So number four would be time series. And number five is perseverance. Um, it's kind of a unique characteristic and a skill. Like, you know, when people tell you you're building character when you're doing hard things, I think that's something that a lot of people just don't have. I think that's why 
um, I've gotten so far in my career and I've passed so many people at such a young age is the fact that I just persevere thing through things. And even when like I fail and I do terrible, um, I stop, I analyze, I reanalyze, um, and I give it another shot over and over again until you figure out how things work um, and you can basically succeed at what you're working on. So I guess those are my top five skills on the fly. Um, next question, how and when did you get interested in finance? So my route's a little different than most people's. Um, I worked in a startup company that my father was the president of, um, had a bunch of other external investors. It wasn't like family owned or anything. But I worked there as a blue collar laborer, building uh, precast concrete structures, restroom buildings, utility buildings. Um, so I did all the manual labor. And then my dad was like still running the business and they needed somebody to do finance. I was going to school. I started out studying biology. Um, I wanted to be a plastic surgeon. Um, I ended up changing for some personal reasons. I didn't really like blood, for example, kind of a big uh, deal breaker for plastic surgeons. And so I ended up thinking like, I don't know what I wanna do. My father's running this business. Um, I love being kind of involved in a lot of the business aspects. So I went into business and then I realized finance just seemed more interesting and more complex um, than the other areas of business like management, um, accounting, marketing, stuff like that. So I chose finance and I graduated. Um, then I realized after graduation, it's going a little beyond your question here, um, I graduated and nobody would hire me. I went to a no-name school and it was great and wonderful, but at the end of the day, nobody would hire me and I felt like I got screwed with a finance degree because I knew finance really well, but I didn't feel like I had the quantitative tools to actually implement it, which is why I went into financial engineering and quantitative finance. Um, and then the last question here, how good is your computer science background and how did you learn to code? So I'm gonna break this down a little bit. So one thing most people don't know about me is I love programming. Um, if you look back throughout my career and you say, Dimitri, what was like your number one day? Like what was the best day in your career? What are the top five days um, in your career? Out of this top five, probably three out of the top five are all programming days. These days where I'm like at the office there's nobody around, I have my headphones on, and I'm just like coding away for, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 hours straight. So I love programming, it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, that being said, I don't have a lot of time to do it. So our job consists of like programming, and then you're switching gears, and you're like writing documents, and then you're switching to like statistical theory, and then you're kind of bouncing around. And so a lot of times I do programming for a bit of time, and then I get switched, and then it's kind of frustrating sometimes because you have to switch gears so often, but um, I love programming. I think programming as a computer science skill for me is actually pretty good. I think I would outrank most um, well-rounded quants. So if you compare me to like a computer science master's PhD student, no, I'm not gonna be as good as them. Um, they do this every day. Uh, but for computer science, I'm better than most. The thing I wanna point out as well is computer science is not programming. So I think a lot of people confuse this. Yes, computer scientists program, but there's a lot of theory behind computer science, like how you write the code, how you logically put it together, that's the hard part, right? Writing the code is simple, but being able to write the correct code and knowing how to put the logic together uh, is crucial. And I think most people in quantitative finance who are not computer science backgrounds don't really know anything about computer science. They're just functional in programming. So they can write things and make things happen, but it's not done correctly. Um, there's not memory management going on, so things run slower than slow. Um, they're not functional. I get super frustrated because people don't follow like best practices. In every company I've been at, I've actually pushed and wrote, written documents um, on best practices for programming. Nobody follows them, things end miserably. We spend hundreds of hours fixing and refixing and rewriting crappy code just because people don't do it right the first time. One of these I can tell you is that people don't do things in a logical manner. So I see people that will write code and then they don't use part of it and then they keep writing more code and then they keep writing more code and they keep writing more code and then when you get to the end of it, you realize like two thirds of it isn't even used. And instead of like cleaning your code up before you submit it to someone, so before you submit it to validation or before like a colleague gives you code, it should be cleaned. And I know I am not perfect at this. There are things in my code once in a while that are just like artifacts of things that I used to use but don't use anymore. But I try to actually clean all of my code. Uh, this is a huge pet peeve of mine. 
you need to clean your code, you need to be optimal. It's just one example, a little bit of a tangent here. Um, how did you learn to code? That was a really good question. Um, so I actually started again at a startup company doing manufacturing. The company needed help building a website. I actually started in HTML and CSS. Most people in computer science will look down on you and like, that's terrible, it's not really programming. Um, but that was kind of my foot in the door. And then I started teaching myself um, C++ programming from online videos on YouTube. Um, I absolutely love programming. I think it's great, as I mentioned. Um, but learning C++, I think, is the number one skill you should have because learning to program in a low-level language like C++ really gets you to cover all of the important aspects behind programming as a whole. Being able to do that really well is crucial. If you know C++, you can easily learn and teach yourself Python or R or I don't know, Java or Ruby on Rails, right? There's all these other languages you can use, but I think C++ is the language I would learn first, but it was more of a fact that you won't use it in practice a lot, but you will use it like in an intellectual computer science kind of background. Anyways, that's the interview of me based on the questions you guys have asked. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more videos like this. And as always, until next time.